I invite to the, the our speaker, sorry, is Miss Sonia Brown, who comes to us with a message that I'm sure will inspire you, will bless you, and will motivate you to just keep on the path. So. <laughs> Good morning, friends. Good morning. And let me welcome you again to this morning service. Um, as we sat here reading, the, doing the responsive reading, I was thinking, well, it has said it all. That's my message for the day. <laughs> This morning, I'd like to share some thoughts with you for the message I've drawn heavily on the foundations of foundation of mysticism by Joel Goldsmith, which I know some of you have been reading, like I have. One of the area it addresses is God realization. I believe most of us, if not all, know that in our centers, that is centers for spiritual living, we teach a form of prayer called spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer. This can be taught as a three-step, five-step, or seven-step process. This morning, I will look in part on the five-step process. The first step is recognition. That is recognition of God, divine spirit. In this step, we recognize the perfection of God and the qualities of God. We usually identify some of these qualities as love, light, life for creative self-expression, health, and peace. Those of us who have been coming here for some time will remember that in our practitioner service on a fourth Sunday, we used to include specific treatments for love, light, health, creative self-expression, and peace. The second step is unification. Here we affirm that we are one with this spirit. That is, we affirm our oneness with God, the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient spirit. And we usually identify a specific quality of God. For example, light or health, or whatever particular quality your focus is on the, in the treatment. Then comes the th third step, realization. Let us look at the word. Two definitions which I found are an act of becoming fully aware of something. And second, the achievement of something desired. Synonyms for the word are awareness, consciousness, understanding, actualization, fulfillment, achievement, attainment, and consummation. In spiritual realization, therefore, our goal is actualization of the truth of our being, our oneness with divine spirit an elevation of our consciousness to that stage where we know not just intellectually, but we are inwardly aware of and embody the qualities of divine spirit to the extent that we allow ourselves to be the channels through which these qualities manifest. We allow these qualities to become real to us. We embody God in such a way that we live from a consciousness of God realization. Qu 
Quoting from Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker, it is a thing of an inward feeling or interior awareness in that place where the mind has unified itself with the living spirit. They go on. There is an inner life of complete perfection which exists at the center of everything, otherwise nothing could be. We should identify ourselves with this perfect pattern of our being, claiming its reality in our experience and continuously knowing that we are animated by the living spirit, end of quote. Continuously, always, always, always. We don't divorce this feeling from our everyday lives. We don't just call on it when we encounter a so-called problem. We live it continuously. So in any place where we find ourselves, any situation, there is this perfect pattern existing. Therefore, we focus on this inner perfect perfection, see this inner perfection in our mind's eye, and live from this inner perfection. Goldsmith says, God is where God is realized. Where God is realized, the grace of God is in expression. The master Jesus was a great example of one who fully lived from a consciousness of God realization. This gave him dominion over his world as he allowed the God presence to work through him to perform what are commonly referred to as miracles. True God realization to me means that we think, live, act with this consciousness in all aspects of our lives, realizing that there is no aspect of our lives where God is not. Joel Goldsmith puts it this way, God must be a living expression. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where is the spirit of the Lord? Where it is realized. What is he trying to say here? Intellectually, we may know that the spirit of the Lord is everywhere, but has it become a very real presence to us? Can we honestly say that in all our parts we acknowledge him and allow him to direct our parts? Or do we just mouth these things? Goldsmith uses what is commonly referred to as the discovery of electricity to exemplify this. Electricity as a form of energy has always existed in nature. However, the realization that it could be harnessed and used productively for specific purposes did not always exist. So it is with our relationship with God. We know that God is an ever-present force within us, but to what extent have we embodied this truth and allowed it to guide our paths? To what extent do we effortlessly live from a consciousness of the presence of God in our lives and affairs? Just this past Friday, I found myself trying to divorce myself from the activity of the God presence. I started getting anxious about preparing this message. <laughs> However, I decided to go into meditation. And once my mind and thoughts calmed down, I heard, let go and let God. You see, friends, we have become so accustomed to using the will to direct things, our personal will, that we forget the need to surrender and let God. And the more we depend on the personal will to accomplish things, the more we manipulate and push and coerce, the more we impede the God presence from working through us. This becomes so easy when we listen to the dictates of the outer world instead of going within. Do we just do a treatment when we feel a need for something? 
Or do we live our lives from the awareness of God as ever present, knowing that the power and presence works through us and as us? When we go into our offices, how do we conduct ourselves? Do we allow ourselves to become influenced by the race consciousness in the way we conduct business? Or do we listen and allow the God spirit within to guide us? If the latter, we are realizing God in what we do and how we behave. If the former, then we are not. I surrender the mental movements to the expansive indwelling heart of God within. This is a quotation from Reverend Julie Schmidt's daily writings in the March Science of Mind magazine. I surrender the mental movements to the expansive indwelling heart of God within. Let me ask you, what if we surrender the mental movements which have been conditioned by our socialization, race consciousness, in large part by the thinking of the outer world, and instead follow the promptings of the expansive indwelling heart of God within? I believe that if we are serious about awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence, then this is what we have to do. We must endeavor to live the truth of our being. That is, that we are children of the Most High, having the qualities of the Most High. The Master Jesus had this consciousness. This is why he was able to turn water into wine. Moses had this consciousness. This is how he led the children of Israel out of slavery. Alan Cohen, in his book, the healing of the planet Earth tells the following story. It is called Getting the Point. And here is the story. At some point in your soul's evolution, you must decide if you are going to live for your heart's calling or for the dictates of the masses. To be truly happy, you must learn to honor and follow the truth that you feel in your own heart. This is especially important when your inner guidance nudges you in a direction other than the one to which most people subscribe. But you must do what you do because it is true for you, regardless of what seems to be true for others. When I was 13 years old, I celebrated my bar mitzvah, one of the most time-honored traditions in the Jewish religion. For years, I prepared by learning the Hebrew language, history, and the significant rituals associated with this rite of passage from youth to manhood. Sitting with my friends in the temple one Sabbath morning, I heard my name called to step up to the altar to recite a blessing over the Torah, the great scroll of the Bible. What should I do when I get up there? I whispered to a big brother. Just watch what they do and do as they do, he answered. Soon, I found myself standing in the center of the house of worship on a platform with the rabbi, the cantor, and the president of the synagogue, all elders of the temple. Anxiously, I recited the blessing and then watched the cantor read from the ancient text. I noticed that he used an ornately carved pointer, a silver tool with a small, hand figure, a small hand figured into the end. He used this instrument, the pointer, to follow the lettering of the Torah from which he chanted in a haunting melody. When he finished reading, he lifted the Torah high above his head, at the sight of which the congregation rose and joined in a traditional chant of praise. Heartening to my friend's advice, I followed the cantor's lead in word and movement. The cantor began his attention, 
sorry, the cantor turned his attention to the soft velour cloth upon which the Torah had lain. Then he began to stroke the table in horizontal movements. The president took his hand and did the same. Then the rabbi came over and performed a like movement over the cloth. Remembering my friend's advice to watch their cues and not wanting to be remiss in performing the appropriate rituals, I stepped up to the altar and began to stroke the cloth in exactly the same fashion. I watched the elders' faces to see if I was doing it correctly, and they were pleased. Well, the cantor whispered to me as I finished. Well, what? I whispered back, hoping I hadn't unknowingly committed a sacrilegious act. Did you find it? He inquired. Find what? The pointer. The, con <laughs> the congregation chanted in the background. What pointer? The point I was using to read from the Torah. I didn't know it was missing. Of course it is missing. Why do you think we were rubbing the cloth? <laughs> I thought it was part of the ceremony. What? Part of the ceremony? We lost the pointer. We thought you were helping to find it. I thought I was performing a religious act. Only if you believe in pointers. End of story. <laughs> now, he, he goes on. Now, I do believe in pointers, but I am starting to see that they are within my heart and not on a table. I believe there is so much that we can learn from this story. In the story, Alan Cohen only added to the confusion by following what the others were doing. He had no idea why they were rubbing the cloth. He was, in a matter of speaking, just following the crowd without knowing why. I believe the story serves to tell us that the true pointer is the spirit within. We cannot change situations by following the crowd. We can only contribute to true change by following the guidance which comes from the heart instead of following the consciousness of the outer world. This is why the master teacher advised us to go within, to enter the closet and listen to the guidance which comes through us. In St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter five, Five, verses 17 to 19, we read. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. This is telling us to listen to that divine spirit within us. We are to allow that spirit to be the pointer, not what the outer world is telling us, but that which we hear from within. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. I believe that to pray without ceasing means that we should in all things practice the presence. We allow our lives to be a prayer. We live from an attitude of God realization. That is, we live from an awareness of the God presence ever within us and allow that presence to guide our goings out and our comings in. When we do this, our light shines, and then we become instruments through which humanity is awakened to its spiritual magnificence. Joel Goldsmith reminds us that we invoke the power of truth by our conscious awareness and declaration of truth. He also advises, always remember that you be, can be of no greater help to anyone than with the activity of truth in your consciousness. How do we develop the state of continuous awareness of the presence of God? 
There are different tools which we are encouraged to use. And among them is meditation. Meditation is encouraged here at the temple and taught by Reverend John. It is my favorite tool for becoming centered. Reverend Schmidt, writing in this month's Science of Mind magazine, tells us that the gift of meditation is seeing it all as one continuous flow. She says, and here I quote, the potential of our inward time of reflection can now become a constant awareness reflected in our daily living. Every moment is an opportunity, opportunity to be present in this flow." End of quote. Diligence in the practice of meditation gets you to that place where you are confident about Spirit's guidance and not afraid to follow this guidance. You don't find it necessary to be part of the crowd. You follow the guidance which comes through you. You become attuned to the guidance of the spirit within. Spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer, is another tool that is taught here that helps us to get to that place where we know and understand the truth of, my, of our being. I have already addressed the first three steps of the five-step process, recognition, unification, and realization. The other two steps are thanksgiving and release. Three, we watch our words. Our words can influence our feeling nature and the feelings of others. If we honestly believe that we are sons and daughters of God, we will use words which honor this relationship. I don't recall where I found this quotation, but I think it drives home the impact of our words, so I'm going to share it with you. It goes, we all wish to speak truth, but have we realized that every time we make a claim about ourselves, that is different from the claim we make, we would make about God, we are falling into the error of the divine, the divine presence within us. I'll read it again. We all wish to speak truth, but have we realized that every time we make a claim about ourselves that is different from the claim we would make about God, we are falling into the error of denying the divine presence within us, end of quote. Think about it, friends. Whenever we make a claim about ourselves or another that is different from the claim that we would make about God, we are making the error of denying the divine presence within us. So friends, we should watch our words, and our conversations. Remember, we are all branches of the same tree. God, the omniscient, omnipotent source of all life. One of the other tools which I enjoy and employ is reading books authored by various truth teachers. It reinforces for me that life truly is eternal because the authors that I enjoy most have all passed from this plane of existence, and yet their light continues to shine, and I am able to feel their energy and learn from them. So friends, let us know that all life is God's life. All life is eternal. All life is perfect, whole, and complete and all life is God in action. There is a treatment which you should find inserted in your program. <clears throat> it is taken from Richer Living by Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker. May we say it together? <clears throat> Today, I say to myself, I am one with the truth of God. 
I speak this truth and proclaim it to be the reality of my experience in what I call little and in what I call big. In the simplest and the most complex things, I recognize the one truth, changeless, permanent, and eternally manifest in itself. Therefore, know the truth about myself. I know the truth about everything I do. I know the truth about everyone I meet. I know the truth about every situation I find myself in. This truth is not only perfection, it is also power. It is not only presence, it is also action. Therefore, the truth and the power and the presence and the action of the living spirit flow through everything I do, say, and think. I do know the truth, and the truth I know frees me and keeps me free. And so it is. Namaste.